edition of North of Ordinary 2012, sponsored by Yukon North of Ordinary Magazine. I'm Lauren Tuck. Today we're going to go and check out local filmmaker Celia McBride, the DC3 yarn bomb, visit some tiny houses, see what our curious gardener has been up to, and meet Crystal and Greg Karias, publishers of North of Ordinary Magazine. But first on the show, welcome Steve McGovern, local comedian, who's going to be joining me in the great garage sale scavenger hunt. Are you ready, Steve? Oh, I was born ready, Lauren. And you are going down. Actually, you're going down. And you know how I know that? I'm a champion, and I don't lose. Well, champion, I hope you have your mouth guard, because it's going to get rough out there. Before we get started, though, I think that we need to welcome our judge and producer of Cable 9's North of Ordinary show, Chris McNutt. He's going to be letting us know all about the rules of today's competition. Good morning, competitors. Welcome to the Great Garage Sale Scavenger Hunt here at Cable 9. Both teams will be given a list of items to acquire at Scavenger Hunts this Saturday morning in Whitehorse. $35 and two hours in order to complete the task. Points will be awarded for acquiring each item along with bonus points for extra pizzazz that each item has with it. Competitors, time is now 9.20 a.m. You have to assemble back here to the garage sale items at 11.20. On your marks, get set, go! <laughs> Last Stop is a dramatic feature film about a woman named January who witnesses the murder of her best friend and blames herself for it and so she kind of goes into a spiral of self-destruction and she comes back to Whitehorse where the murder happened and falls into a love affair with the ex-boyfriend of her dead friend. If we count it from the beginning, the inception, it would be a 20-year journey. I wrote this play called Last Stop for Miles when I was at the National Theatre School in 1992. And one of the actors said, this would make a great movie. So I started to write the screenplay in about 2002. Then when I moved back to the Yukon in 04, and saw that there was a burgeoning film community here and that there was funding from the Yukon Film and Sound Commission. That was one of the things that helped me decide to stay. I needed to learn how to make movies. I was a playwright and a theater artist. And I asked a director named Gary Burns, who was here shooting Northern Town, and he said, well, you have to make a short film. And I said, okay, I could do that. So that was the last stop for Miles the Short, which you can watch on YouTube, you can find it on my website, it's on, it's on the internet. And from then, I just kept learning how to make movies. I made a couple more shorts. I did the Women in the Director's Chair workshop at the Banff Center this past year. That really was the final clincher for me being prepared to actually make a feature film. In the last two years, I've been working really hard to make the big budget feature. I mean the big small budget feature, half a million dollars, but I had two producing partners in Vancouver, I had a crew in Vancouver, I had a whole whack of money from Telefilm Canada, and then the funding fell through and my producing partners and I decided to part ways and I decided to make the project as I'm making it now, which is lean and mean, down and dirty, guerrilla style filmmaking, really small crew and call it a community art project. I just got into this project kind of the last minute. I was going to do sound and then now I'm doing camera and uh, it's, it's very run and gun. We just have two act actresses right now so they're like basically permanently mic'd up. A lot of times we're just grabbing a shotgun with a wireless and it's, it's really just trying to get the best job we can to do it really quickly. Many things that need to be done on a small production. Rolling out cable, doing traffic control, taking still shots, shooting the featurette at the same time and um, it's uh, really nice to see a small crew and it's all local people. It's a real community effort. I'm thrilled. Every day I just am blown away that people are showing up in the way that they are to give, give of themselves their time and their energy. It's fantastic. I'm very surprised that it's actually happening. <laughs> like I'm walking to the set going, I'm doing it. I am actually shooting Last Stop for Miles right now. And all of the scenes that are in my head, I'm now, you know, standing at the monitor looking at Claire Ness and Angela Code and Kelvin Smoller doing these scenes. and. I, I almost can't believe it. It's like the manifestation of a vision. It's it's pretty cool. Good. That was great. Okay, 
When you're watching this, Lauren, you'll see that we started out by pumping tires. That's how confident we are. I spot a garage sale! Good thing I got some power locks. <laughs> oh yeah, we got the key. Is this from Ikea? Excuse me. Is this from the 80s? Very nice, sir. Wait, cassette tape, man. That's on there, isn't it? Boom, set shake. You know what? Nice. We only got 35 bucks too, man. We got a haggle too. We got a lot of like it. Logo on it That's it? a nice one. Good how happy these farm animals are. Get out of here, Jeff. Will this not pacify a baby? Totally pacify a baby. You tell me, daddy. Definitely, man. This is what you do. You get a helper and then you just delegate. I'm just gonna hang out. Let him do all the work. Watch and learn, Lauren Tuck. This is a lady's toy, isn't it? <clears throat> Mickey Mouse? Curly and iron, yeah. See, that's why you're the best, Dave. Curly and iron this. Uh, can we give you five for the book and this? Mm -hmm. Sure. Something inflatable. There you are. Hit <laughs> it. Is it? Oh yeah, yeah man. No. Whoa, speed two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the hard one. Oh, we got it now. I don't know, man, but it's a VCR, right? It's an item from the '80s. No. Oh. Anyway, I got five bucks for everything. Five bucks for it all. Seven bucks. How about seven bucks for everything? You, got, you guys, I got, I got change. Seven change. bucks for everything, then we can just get out of here. <laughs> My name is Jessica Valenga and I'm the Yarn Bomb Yukon Coordinator. Basically what I'm doing is organizing a national art project, getting knitters and crocheters from all across Canada and the states to join in and make a gigantic public art project to cover the DC3 in yarn. It's an international art movement that started in the mid-2000s and it's been taken up all across the world with people yarn bombing tanks and bikes and buses and cars and uh, post office boxes and anything and everything you can think of has been yarn bombed except for an airplane. I began yarn bombing as an extension of my art practice, which is textile-based, so I did little yarn bombs around town, and then moved on to bigger things. Casey McLaughlin, director of the Yukon Transportation Museum, approached me about uh, yarn bombing the plane, so it went from there. I was in Vancouver Lighthouse Park in February, and my girlfriend and I were hiking around, and when I came across this old signpost, but the sign was gone. There wasn't, it was just this poor little rusted old signpost, but someone had made a cozy for it, and I thought, what a great idea. And then I came back and I was talking to Mary Bradshaw about what I saw. And then we kind of jokingly said, what about the DC-3? And we're like, wait a minute, we know Jessica and she's crazy enough to try and make this work. I think what more than anything we're super excited about is that so many people can participate. And it's not just that we're showing art, this is about creating art. From one stitch at a time to, to even knitting a tiny little square to giant blankets, you can be part of this huge public art installation. Our public call for participation um, was heavily based on social media. We have a Facebook page, a blog, website, uh, Twitter, and uh, Artsnet's awesome. Yarn bombing is such a huge movement. There's there's a whole social media site devoted to yarn bombing, actually. It's yarnbombing.org. So there's great platforms that already exist out there that we can use. I knew I wanted blanket size patterns. It's a preference that knitters and crocheters are used to. It's also useful. We can give them to charities when they're done. Um, if they're in still good condition when they get off the plane. Well, then we worked with an architect to develop the pattern. Once we had the pattern, it was the knowing then how much square footage we needed to gather, so for the public call of participation. Got all the stuff, we marked out the pattern that we had from the architect uh, onto the floor and then gridded out our blankets from there. And we've been hosting our sit and stitch at the old fire hall for the last couple of weeks and tomorrow we wrap up. We have a great construction crew, Ketsu Construction has uh, volunteered their time and equipment to help us yarn on the plane because she is Canada's largest weather vane and on a stick we've got to secure her and then get trained how to use um, safety lifts and scissor lifts and fun things like that. And then we'll be up there, we'll be wrapping the plane and securing it from below with rope. We're kind of bringing the world of arts and industry industry together which isn't very common. We're kind of seeing it as the museum as an opportunity to really make our collection a more community-based thing so people can get involved. It's accessible by more people. It's not just this airplane on a stick. It's untouchable. It's like, hey community, let's get involved. We've had knitters and crochets from all across North America. There's been over 100 people who've been involved. Um, people as young as seven and as old as 90. I think people really enjoy being able to alter their environment in a non-permanent way. It's fun, it puts smiles on people's face, it doesn't harm anything. Yarn bombing is, is becoming you know, a really big art movement globally, so I think this is a really exciting chance that we can really jump on um, on this early trend and, uh, and really be part of it and, and do something incredibly giant.
learn the proper rules of driving. It's simple. Oh, you're, you're shooting right by it, Jay. Let's uh, spin her around. Do it, man. So here we are at a 409 low. All right, man, look, check it out. Oh, right. no, there's rats. Is this Barbie? Actual Barbie? Do you know? I don't know of like a specific toy that came out in the 80s. I'm not getting creepy. I'm looking for a date. Yeah, do you guys have a bird feeder? Whoa, whoa. Hey, hey buddy, check this out. Right here. Okay, okay, okay. Let. There's got to be a toy from the 80s. Just anything from the 80s. Barney, he's probably from the 80s. Is there a date on here? Is there anything from Ikea here? Salt and pepper snowman. Is there a date on this? That's from, yeah, yes, they do. They've got to, because they're fun and toys are fun. What is that? It, it, it's a souvenir kitchen item. I mean, it says coffee mug ashtray, but. The way my uncle smoked, that would be tiny ashtray. Um, Holy crap! Yeah. Sorry, we did it, man. That's it. That's yeah. the 80s. A few okay. master. 80s. Yeah. Love yeah. it. Good. I got a, a five back. Are we going the right way? Yeah. Where are the girls? What happened to them? Were you expecting to bump into them after three garage sales? Okay. What do we got here? This is a wing for a baby. Great. Count? Okay. Yeah. Can we take everything for five dollars, please? Sorry to do that to you for two what? bucks. Okay, perfect. Okay. Awesome. Can we see if we can get for three dollars? Yeah. Hi, I'm Erica Hoyer, and I'm building a tiny home. I fell in love with Tumbleweed Homes about five years ago and harbored the fantasy of living in a tiny home ever since then. My name's Kim Melton and I've lived in this little house um, for about two years now. I was designing little houses for a number of years before I actually realized that I could build one. My name is Rick Clements and I've been living in my tiny house for three weeks now. I'm finding I'm sort of not without anything that I really need. It's just uh, I have less of it and uh, they have to know exactly uh, where to put it. One of the really lovely things about working on a tiny home is that it's a scale that's very manageable, so you get to spend a lot of time on the details, the efficiency of the space, and also just the beauty of the materials and the space itself. I've got um, a wood stove, this lovely little Vermont casting here, that provides all my heat, propane for cooking and light, a little stove and a little oven. Uh, a water tank that I just fill from, uh, from a garden hose and that has just gravity feed down into the, the bathtub. I actually have a bathtub, it's a very small one. I don't have running hot water, but between the stove and the, and the propane stove, that's fine. We also have a sauna on the property. It's pretty much got everything I think you'd want in a, you know, a regular house. There is a bathroom with a shower and a toilet and a sink. I'm standing right in front of the stove, which has a full oven. It runs on propane. And I've got a kitchen sink that uh, runs off a 35-gallon water tank. And under that is a half a bar fridge that runs off electricity, which is mostly powered by my solar panel and electrical system right now. I feel like they are truly the footprint that a single person should have on the planet. The actual small space is um, it definitely it has its challenges, I think, for a lot of people, but I think we tend to expand, whether we're traveling or living, we expand to fill whatever space we have. We all know that it's good to take a smaller backpack if you have an extended backpack and trip, because otherwise you'll end up carrying a lot more stuff that you don't actually need. And I think the same goes for houses. I got the idea of building something on wheels because I just hadn't found a chunk of land that I was really in love with. As soon as I started on that idea, I discovered this huge online community of people that were doing the same thing. The fact that it's portable, I think, is quite marvelous. It'll just be really versatile and mean that I can have uh, an adventurous life without um, not having a home. I think the real benefit, you know, obviously in this is that you certainly, your, uh, your budget is going to be in a way better state by doing this. I mean, if you can get out of uh, sort of that mortgage payment and, and purchase something outright, it's a totally different experience. That's what I've really enjoyed about it. I mean, there's a lot of people in the Yukon, not just tiny houses, but that have built other, you know, alternative forms of, of housing that that they've built themselves and that haven't cost a lot of money, and especially because there's such a housing crisis in the Yukon. Um, I am totally in support of trying to empower people to you know, build their own dwellings. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that that's what everybody did, and I think that we can reclaim that. Okay, this is gonna be the one. This is the one. How much money do we have left? We still have $25. That's so much money. 
Something inflatable. Are you guys selling coffee? Yeah. Let's go. Let's go, Dave. They have coffee, but we don't got time. And next up, we're going to we have free coffee and donuts. So that we've hit a the worst thing that could have happened. We hit a place that the girls have already hit. But you never know. I wouldn't put past Lauren to miss a whole whack of stuff. Oh, do you guys have a birdhouse? Yeah, I bought a bunch of them. They didn't buy anything. They didn't buy anything. Oh, 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 balloons. Oh my god, Tuck, what are you doing? Is this a garage sale here? Or are people just having a good time hanging out in this driveway? What is this? Could this be from a wedding? If you were a flower girl, would you wear this? Yeah! <laughs> Do you have a little cassette tape by oh, chance? Yeah. Yes, yeah, please! Thank you, buddy! Okay, so what are you guys asking for? Oh my god, you girls rock. Isn't that a beauty? Birdhouse, boom. Ah. Boom. Coffee, boom. Boa, slam. That's your own personal. Okay. Thank you. We need something for a wedding. Something we got this here. homemade bird feeder. Okay. She's looking for a Speedo oh, for us. Yeah. Isn't Speedo like little. Can we give you $5 for everything? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so Good luck. All right, well, at the beginning of the show, uh, the producer, Chris McNutt, never mentioned that I couldn't bring in a secondary co-pilot. So what I decided to do is tag off and bring in my mom. Yay! Steve McGovern, you're going down, buddy. Hello, I'm Arlen McFarlane, and I'm your Curious Gardener, and I'm here today with Ruth Lira, and we're going to be talking garlic. Garlic has been um, kind of the theme of my gardening career. The first farms I ever worked on were garlic farms. And so for whatever reason, it's always been our dream that when we have a garden to grow garlic. We've been very lucky to have traveled to Finland and learned about a spring northern planting technique that's been really successful here. So last year we grew 55 pounds of garlic. We just kind of continue to keep our own seed. What we do is we select for the biggest garlic and then we store that over the winter and we put it in the fridge to give it a frost in the spring and then we plant it out. And that way every year we're increasing our yield as well as kind of genetically selecting for the biggest, best garlic. And then you plant it out here, like when in the spring? As early as you can work the soil. Be so while I put there's it out, still frosts happening. Let's say first week of May. Say so you have a nice head of garlic, you break it apart to the cloves and you plant those cloves and they're your seed. Kind of like a potato, how a potato you eat and it's your seed, um, garlic is the same. What we're looking for for harvesting is you want the stalk to be about two thirds yellow. You know, I'm hoping that will be about, let's say the third week of September. And then we need to dry them for a few weeks. You have to dry them very thoroughly if they're gonna store through the winter, twist off the roots, um, cut off the stalks and you're good to go. These all need to wait a little while longer before sure. we actually the, harvest the them. The garlics are going to wait, but what's beautiful is that we have these garlic scapes that we can eat now. And I'm harvesting full fulls of garlic scapes every day and I'm pickling them and making them into pesto. Mmm, it smells nice. Yeah. It smells mild garlicky. Yeah, they're really delicious. So it's, it's kind of like you get two crops. Up here at the top is where you would make another seed. So by pulling the garlic scapes out, you can put more energy um, into the bulb. What are good growing conditions for garlic? You know, garlic isn't that picky in terms of soil. It likes it kind of good drainage and not, not too rich. For our garden, everything is based on compost. And so the important thing for the garlic with the spring planting is to prepare the bed in the fall. Because the biggest challenge we have here the first week of May is that actually the compost is still a big frozen pile. What are you doing with so much garlic, Ruth? Well, it's true. Everyone who comes goes, what are you doing with all the garlic? And then their next question is, can I buy some? Which shows you that there's a market for garlic. People really want good garlic. What they don't want is Chinese garlic. And what's happened in Canada is that the market got flooded with Chinese garlic and Canadians stopped growing garlic. And the only way to start again is we have to develop seed. And so what I'm trying to do is grow the garlic, put the seed aside, plant it again, and develop kind of a Yukon hardy seed. All right, let's pick one and see what's going on under there. All right. Oh my, look at that, that's beautiful. There we go, we're that's getting there. That's big. Yeah, and so my hope would be still another four to six weeks until I harvest them. We have a special occasion in the garden. We have a giant turnip that you kids have been helping your mom grow, and we're gonna pick the turnip. All right, I think it's gonna take all three of us. You coming in, Enz? Okay. All right, you ready? 
I'm Arlen McFarlane, your curious gardener. My guest today has been Ruth Lira, and we've been talking garlic and, of course, the giant turnip. See you next time. This way. Okay. Onward and upward. Oh, man, man, this is the first time I've ever been up before noon. I didn't think garage sales were actually real. This is kind of fun. So we're getting down to the wire. The only things we need now are Speedo or wedding item. Something from a wedding. Okay, Mom, let's get on this. Do you have anything here from Ikea? Right there. Oh, oh they even say Ikea! <laughs> I'm just gonna see if there's something. Do you have anything Speedo? These were vases at the wedding. At a wedding on the table. That's oh, perfect, perfect. Okay, birdhouse feeder left, we're done here. Oh my goodness. Wow, thank you so much. That's awesome. It's Christmas air, or it's wedding cake. Can I get a hug? Okay. So much. Garage sailing. <laughs> It's 11 o'clock. So fur is the next one and elm is the next one. You got it, that's gotta be it. Do you have a Speedo or a birdhouse here or anything by Northwest Tell? I've got a phone book. 25 cents. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go. Time, time, time. Tick, tick, tick. Our fourth garage sale, and yeah, one item left, Speedo. Never had a Speedo. No Speedos? No. <laughs> they asked you that no Speedos? Bad. They were, you're rocking a Speedo. Who put Speedo on the list? Come on. Dude, I think, I think the girls tapped it out. We gotta make a bold move, go somewhere where they wouldn't go, and and grab that Speedo. Maybe bending the rules a bit, but you gotta be malleable in this world, right? If we're not gonna find it here, we're not gonna find it anywhere. Oh my god. Yeah, this is a lot of used underwear. I've never dug so vigorously through so. used underwear before, but... Hi, I'm Craig Rice. I'm the owner publisher of Harper Street Publishing, which is publisher of what most people would know as uh, Yukon North of Ordinary, and we have a few other publications that are published here in the territory. I'm Crystal Karayas, and uh, Greg and I operate Yukon North of Ordinary Magazine and the other publications with Harper Street Publishing. Harper Street Publishing started in 1994 with the Dawson City Insider, which we originally printed 3,000 publications. And that was a newsprint magazine with lots of historical sto stories. Everything was pretty much italicized, underlined, and bolded in because I'm not a designer, nor was I at the time, but somehow we managed to do that. It was mostly available in Dawson City first, but over time it was all over Alaska and the entire Yukon Territory as far as Dawson Creek. Over the years that changed name to Guide to the Gold Fields, Alaska Yukon. Uh, Alaska Road Trip, and now it's just Road Trip North of Ordinary, so we can brand the North of Ordinary name. 1998 or so, we came up with the German language magazine. I'm pretty confident that was the first one that, that came out in the Yukon Territory as a tourism publication. The idea was, if you're, if you're German or you're traveling from somewhere else, sometimes it's just nice to relax and read something in your own language. All those magazines, I drove over the entire highway system myself in a beat-up Mazda B2200. Driving down to Dawson Creek, Fairbanks, Anchorage, Valdez, back to Dawson City. Basically, it was a giant blur. It was more like I didn't live in Dawson, but I lived in my vehicle and I was a, a full-time camper through the summer months from May till August, September. We moved from Dawson and we had found that Dawson was too far for us to manage North of Ordinary. And um, we moved out here and we actually feel like we're so much closer to everything, even though to most of our friends in Whitehorse, we feel like we're way out here. Originally the magazines were up and down the highway system available at the visitor centers, but in order to sell more ads, people wanted those publications in the hands of the tourists before they got here. I was lucky enough to make contact with Condor when they first started flying over here. They accept the publication in flight and that was kind of like opening a door into a hallway full of door handles where you just got to shake on other doors. And obviously Air North was out there with jet service. And Air North being as true as they are to the Yukon Territory, they accepted my, my proposal. And that was five and a half years ago now that we've been publishing an in-flight magazine on their behalf. One of the coolest things about what's going on with this whole public publishing business is that we live on the Tagish Road on the side of the mountain with an incredible view. We have internet access. And when I go to town, I got an iPhone and I own and operate my business pretty much remotely. We wouldn't be here unless there was internet. We'd have to be in Whitehorse. That's why we left Dawson City, was because it just it was too far away. You know, we're able to school our kids and we're able to grow a garden and we're able to operate a successful business here. As far as getting in touch with people, Manu Kegenhoff is our designer in Atlin and we can find her online when we need to find her. Duma Alwarid is our production manager, and she is in Whitehorse. We also have Wayne Crow, who's our salesman in Whitehorse. And then we also have Terry McCarthy, who is in Whitehorse, and she we find her online. So 
It's a very virtual office. And we want to be that organization where we are all able to live our lives. We want people to, to live their dreams. And we want people to be able to take care of their families and be able to do the things that are important to them and still contribute with us in the capacity that we need them. If it wasn't farm home family, it would be the same as anyone else running a home-based business, whether they're doing the laundry or baking bread or whatever. Here we just happen to have a couple of donkeys <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> a couple of dogs, a couple of cats. A lot of people in the world of publishing and just in business are the kind of envious of what we have here and every day I feel lucky for it. I think people greatly appreciate North of Ordinary. I think uh, for myself it was right time, right place to be able to start something. I want Yukoners to, to own North of Ordinary. It's not about, I don't really believe it's about me. I want Yukoners to own that publication. I kind of sense that. They, they want to see it, they encourage it, they take it places. Nobody says no. And you know, at the end of the day, what, what it really is, we have a lot of advertisers in that publication. And they're advertising it because they're proud of that publication. And I think that says that speaks volumes. As far as publications go in Canada, I'm very confident to say that Yukon North Ordinary is a really successful magazine. There's a lot of publications that are struggling. And we just seem to be moving the ball forward on a regular basis. And that that's pretty big. I'm pretty proud of that. at Rotary Park for the conclusion of the garage sale scavenger hunt. Okay, going through the items. Land of the Midnight Sun, Dawson City. Alaska. One point each for teams Tuck and McGovern. This is new. This is the Baby Pro Max, oh my God. One point each for Tuck and McGovern, it's a tie. These blue vases were used at a wedding. This is five-year-old wedding cake. One point each bonus point for team McGovern for the five-year-old wedding cake. Wait. The nastiest lava lamp I've ever seen in my life. Just a regular old lamp. One point each, bonus point, Team Tuck. We have a baby pacifier. A swing to pacify a baby. One point each, Team Tuck and McGovern. CD holder still in its original package with its original receipt. Uh, we have a lamp from Ikea and I think Lauren needs to look up the definition of package. One point each, extra point, McGovern for size and electrical function. All you can tweet, bird feeder kit. Yeah, yeah. This is homemade, sorry, made. One point each, bonus point, Team McGovern. It was already made. We got the Viewmaster. Trivial Pursuit. One point each, bonus point, Team McGovern. I would not give my eight-year-old Trivial Pursuit to play with. Original Raffi material. Tape. One point each, bonus point, Team Chuck for the killer Raffi music. Big pink inflatable ball. I'd like to point out that theirs is inflated, therefore not inflatable anymore. One point each, bonus point, size matters, Team Tuck. Smart love. Finding the real you. And if you don't like the book, why don't you watch the videos? Thanks. One point each team, bonus point, Team McGovern for the bonus videos. Next item, Speedo bathing suit. Does this qualify? And where was that purchased? At a garage sale. One point, Team McGovern for the Speedo acquisition. Minus one for shopping at the Sally Ann. Damn it. We got this Northwest Tell bag, and you can get a phone book anywhere. But you can't get last year's phone book for the bargain price of 25 cents. One point each, Team Tuck and McGovern. And the winner by a score of 18 points to 15, Team McGovern! Awesome. All right, Steve, well, you played a good game. Congratulations. You did cheat, though. But maybe we can have a rematch, actually, sometime. Absolutely. Anytime you want to take on the garage sale champ, I'm there. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in this season to North of Ordinary, sponsored by Yukon North of Ordinary Magazine. I'm Lauren Tuck, and we'll see you next time. Hey. Yeah, check it out. Well, you said right. you'd wear that, right? You're going to yeah. put it on, too. That's what you got to do to win, Lauren. You, you want to be in showbiz now? You got to put the speedo on. Uh, yeah, there you go. It, it really accentuates you. Oh my goodness. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>